You're listening to a Whales Are Whales production. You're also listening to Whales. Visit whalesorwhales.com for more projects and shows like this one. Hello everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's show. Today we are going to be talking about The Book Thief by Marcus Zusak, parts 4 through 6. Um, So a couple notes, first of all, if you want to be fully engaged in our discussion, I recommend reading this. You can pick it up on Amazon, Kindle, book places, anywhere. And secondly, if you don't want to hear spoilers, I wouldn't listen to this episode yet because we are not holding back on any. Um, And that's it. With that said, I hope you enjoy our discussion and have a wonderful time. Yeah, yeah, going to go with that. It's a, that's a cut, that's a take. Hello, and welcome to Third Person, a podcast about sharing our love for and conversation about storytelling and fiction. This is season one, still. And in it, we're all bringing a different book to read through. And today's book is still Abigail's. We're going to be talking about Act 2 of The Book Thief by Marcus Zusak. And joining me for that today are my two co-hosts, one of which is my brother, whose name is Stephen. Hello, Stephen. Uh, hello there. Hi. Hi. No need to be excessive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being minimalistic. Exactly. How very artful of you. And the other one is Abigail Inslee. Hello, Abigail. Hello. That I was liked, amazing. Yeah, I <laughs> it was like, kind of interesting. Like that. that was fantastic. I that's was that's of, what I want. I was put on the spot like there. The I didn't perfect. know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> You're put on the spot by me greeting you? Yeah, I, I was that's really nervous. <laughs> and for people who don't know, I'm your host, Brian Kelly. You can now use deduction to figure out Stephen's last name. Hi, Brian. <laughs> What is this, Bookaholics Anonymous now? <laughs> uh, that wouldn't have been a terrible name either. That but really wouldn't stupid. have. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we are kind of stupid, but not terrible, so I suppose it would have been fitting. Um, so with the introductions out of the way, this is Act 2 of The Book Thief. So we all hopefully read the apportioned part, which is parts Barely. 4 through 6. Yeah, Stephen, we kind of cut it close. I was, was actually thought you were done. I thought we were doing up to chapter or part five see this is the funny thing when i first said parts four through six i specifically pulled you and said what do you think that means Stephen?" and you said reading all of four five and six and i'm like good it's clear and then you go and read part four and five and tell me it was unclear uh, uh well okay let me rephrase it i thought i was in a different part than i was but i understood the rules oh, okay good because i was afraid that it would be unclear and then you were assuring me that it was fine yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like a basketball player who brings a cantaloupe onto the court, not because he thinks cantaloupes are allowed, but because he thought it was a basketball. Gotcha. That's so a for really a good this... comparison. <laughs> totally I believable, wasn't even too. Really listening, Sports honestly. analogies. Didn't think you'd find him here. <laughs> well, you played tennis. A little yeah. bit. <laughs> a, little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Anyway, so for a discussion of Act 2, um,. For me, instead of going like through the whole thing or all the characters like we did last time, there were just a few different points I wanted to start discussing. And of course, you two can bring up yours as well. But I thought I would, in book thief fashion, describe these points as death would at the beginning of a part. Oh, so, good. a few important discussions. Death, Max and Liesel, Rudy's role and questionable necessity, the point of all this, and an ill-settled security. And we can now go about discussing all of those. That sounds so the pretty first good. one was death. What do we all think about his role going forward in the book now? Uh, better. I've warmed to um, pull, I've warmed to the whole death thing since the last time we talked. <laughs> <laughs> his characters definitely come out more and I'm really appreciating it. His, it's not even just the narrative and the way that he's telling things is great um, because he's done a lot of these little things that just make me go, ooh, mm-hmm. that was kind of cool the way you said that. But right. he's had his own chapters. That has been great. His journal, reading from Death's journal. Yes, that has been been really cool. And I think that, honestly, I think his his role as far as the storytelling aspect of it goes is to basically keep us apprised of what's happening in the rest of the world right now. And kind of like focusing out and being like, hey, guess what? A war is still going on. But... Because it's from the point of view of death, it's being told in a very much more interesting way. You know, he's like, my boss is like looking over my shoulder the whole time and I have to get all these souls and it's so hard. It's yeah, really I like funny. that 
because it feels like typically what they have to do for these types of books is bring in, you know, have Lisa overhear conversations or hear things on the radio, hear things at school and keep you abreast of the world that way. And either info dump more than a child would probably know at that point or kind of not really give you that much information. But death is a nice bridge between the two things where Absolutely. they can keep the main characters blissfully ignorant of that stuff while also bringing all of this stuff to your attention. I'm not really sure there's a, a reason you need it brought to your attention, though. Because not a lot of if it, Liesl, no. Liesl's just going to encounter things about the horror she lives, um, she she can't avoid it, really. Well, no, and I'll be right Oh, okay. Well, well I, guess I, have, I guess I offended <laughs> Ryan again. It's so <laughs> difficult working with him. Continue. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> what was I saying? War... She will encounter them. Um, yes. So no matter what, no matter how she lives her life, she's eventually going to run into into things that will remind you of the war. And it's a war that has been so well documented and so many stories have been mm -hmm. written about it. You could probably just connect the dots without any kind of info dump. Especially That's since true. it really doesn't really matter. You know the Nazis are there. You know the Jews are bad news for anyone who's going to be helping them. And that's all you really need to know for this story. So I'm not saying that that I don't appreciate death kind of giving us a broader look, but I certainly don't think it's necessary for the story. That's true. And I guess it all depends on where the story's going, because we still don't know if it's going to have a huge plot. I don't think it is going to have a huge, big, you know, finale. Oh, all this stuff happened and crazy and everyone died. Brian! Everyone died? Yes! What happened while I was gone? <laughs> We're just talking about death and death's role and not All right. not being I'm not sure if this story's gonna get bigger than it is. Um mm -hmm. if it's gonna you No, know, it's gonna end, right? Third... It's gonna end with Max uh boxing Hitler, right? Oh I assume that's yeah, where this is going. absolutely. And then they're gonna okay. lure him into a theater and explode it. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh no yep. jokes, no jokes. Okay. Um but anyways, my my thing was um going through and looking at this, I like I kind of like seeing the broad scope of what's happening because it does give me some more emotion. I do agree mm -hmm. with Stephen's point. It does not I totally agree need to be told mm -hmm. necessarily for the story. But I so kind do you of think, like yeah. seeing who death is through it, which has been really yeah. interesting. I think that's a good point. And I think you're right, Stephen, that these events, and maybe this is your point, maybe it's not, uh, they more of illuminate death than death is illuminating these events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I think that's a good point, and especially since uh, Death is starting to reveal himself as, um, in a way, having weaknesses. Um, before he seemed all-knowing and totally went about his business and kind of felt mm -hmm. sorry for all the humans who were dying, but now he's like, hey, this is tough. And especially at the very end where we were reading, he seemed a bit uh, confused. <laughs> like, yeah. he seems to have a hard... De Death is apparently not an easy title to hold. And it's not no, something... No, he's constantly talking about how tired he is. Yeah. Um, yeah. I also find it interesting how he goes out of his way to spoil the story for his <laughs> audience. And he's just like, whoops, I spoiled it. Oh, well, you know what's going to happen. I don't really care about that. Um, yeah. Which is funny. That definitely... uh, we predicted... Go ahead, Abigail. I was just going to say, as far as him spoiling things, that was actually one of the things that I thought about as I was reading. Um, not only does that make him the most interesting character I've ever read, because he's like, oh, yeah, by the way, Rudy dies, so there's that. I'm like, what? <laughs> In two years? And yeah. so that really upset me, though, honestly, reading it. I'm like, I would have rathered you let me read to the end, and then he died, because then I would have gotten a little more time blissfully ignorant but at the same time mm -hmm. i'm really appreciative of how the author has been able to successfully tug on my emotions during this part yeah because that's what i like about books is the emotional uh tugging so when death comes out and says something like oh yeah one of these characters that i made you kind of fall in love with yeah he dies and it's so casual it just kind of makes you want to cry a little bit yeah, well, death would do that. He would. Uh, you know, death makes you cry. I mean, that's not exactly out of the ordinary. No, death makes you stop breathing, Brian. <laughs> She's got a point. It got me there, Abigail. Um, that's a, On that sobering note, um, <laughs> something I do want to mention is a lot of us, I believe we said in Act 2, we were all predicting that Hans would die. We were wrong. Yeah, apparently. We were pretty wrong about that. And, you know, with Rudy also dying, I'm not sure that's the direction they're going to go at this point especially with the scare with max almost dying mm -hmm. it, um, it is kind of interesting how they uh, managed to 
I would sort of transfer your um, fear and emotion from um, from uh, Hans to Max, mm-hmm. whom mm-hmm. I didn't think was going to. He, I thought he was going to be more of a plot device rather than the main character you're caring about. Maybe right. it's just because Liesel kind of grew so close to him in a strange mm-hmm. way through these days of him hiding in the basement. You kind of thought about him a lot more than anyone else. And Hans so, was there yeah. to help, but you weren't worried about Hans anymore. So that transitions nicely into my second point I wanted to talk about, which was Max and Liesel. Um, this act was pretty much entirely about Max coming to their house, living with them, and the relationship that develops between him and Liesel. So any thoughts about that? Was it good? Was it not? Um, at first, stuff. at first, I thought it was a little weird um, because I'm like, these two are growing awfully close. But at the same time, um, as I was going through, I was remembering, mm-hmm. you know, she herself equated him to being her brother. And she's right. like, how could I forget my own flesh and blood? And then I just thought back to act one and how the author totally foreshadowed this relationship before it came yeah. up, which made it feel very realistic um, because he had her waking up every night with nightmares. It wasn't until Max mm-hmm. uh, or shortly before, I think, Max came maybe at the same time. It was around that time that she stopped having nightmares about her brother. Um, and then Max came and basically has been taking that role. And so it's kind of been right. this, I've dealt with this, I've healed from this, and now I can let someone else in. And it's been a very interesting so emotional. So it's almost like she got her surrogate father and her surrogate mother, and now she's getting her surrogate exactly. brother. Exactly. Uh, and kind of piecing a family back together from all these people around her. And it's funny because it's still the most unfortunate situation that she could possibly be in. A foster mm-hmm. mother, a foster father, and a Jewish brother. <laughs> <laughs> what I like, one point. thing I really like is that it's so it's so hard to live with and so, so much tragedy surrounds this. But Liesel, maybe it's just who she is or maybe it's just being a kid. But she manages to have a happy, normal childhood anyway. Mm-hmm. Like, despite it all, she, you know, like when they were building the snowman, it's like that would be like the worst Christmas I could possibly imagine in my entire life. Mm-hmm. But to her, it was great. It was the best Christmas they'd ever had. And, you mm-hmm. know, they, they, it's just, it's, you want to talk about books letting you live in someone else's shoes. At this point, I'm starting to feel a bit like that, at least more than I was in the beginning of the story. Right. I think partially because it's less of an origin story at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, so it feels like it's doing more of its own thing with the story it's deciding to tell instead of establishing things that feel familiar. Like, mm-hmm. apart from the bomb shelter scare, and even that was really short, it is not nearly as much about hiding a Jew as I thought it would be. Mm-hmm. Uh, a story that I think is kind of, it's weird to call it played out because it was, you know, such a seminal event in modern history and has so many you know, emotional resonances you can do, but it's almost a cheap tactic to use in something World War II at this point. You want tension? Hide something from the Nazis. Um, Mm -hmm. It's like in every World War II story. Well, one way Um, that this book avoids the trope is to have death almost flippantly, but oddly, um, respectfully note that this is essentially a trope. That he'll just say, and in this case, it was a Jew. And you're supposed to know everything that means. He's like, yep, right. that was the situation. You know it. I know it. Here's what happened. That's um, a good point. That it, does help to mitigate it. And also that they're living their lives. Like, every time they talk to him, it's not about how they're going to hide him. I mean, it actually comes up pretty rarely. Mm-hmm. It's just a reality of life. They figured they that out. They're doing the basement yeah. thing. It's shaky, and they've had some some close calls, but uh, it's working. The, the story is about Max adjusting and growing closer to them and possibly being taken away. One thing Mm -hmm. I really liked was um, it it wasn't, it's not about how they can hide him, but they did have that one chapter. um, I forget what it was exactly titled, but it kind of made me cry when I read it because I thought it meant Max was going to die. But they said what to do with a Jewish body. Yeah, that's the, that's that, what I thought because you had mentioned you saw a chapter uh-huh. title and then you that chapter. And I'm like, oh, that's what she. Yep. And I actually I skyped Brian at that point and said, no, 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 and he thought I was dying. Um, but <laughs> I thought that was so such an interesting way to do it because every Jewish book or not Jewish book, but every German Nazi hiding a Jew book is like, oh, you know, mm-hmm. we gotta hide these people, we gotta keep them away from the Nazis. What happens if they find them? In this book, it's 
how do we get rid of the body if he dies? Like, right. How are it's a we question gonna do you don't normally really consider. Exactly. We can't leave him in the basement. We can't take him out. We can't explain this in any way. And so it's not only vital that they hide him from the Nazis, it's vital mm-hmm. that they keep him alive, which has been right. a very interesting struggle. And I really especially, like that. Especially since uh, I think it's human nature to feel like a twinge of guilt when you start thinking about, oh, man, someone discovering this this corpse in my house is going to be such a nuisance yes well this is a this is a person we're trying to keep him alive we care about the person right right guys Mm -hmm. but it it's those little realities that the characters every once in a while have to dip into Mm -hmm. um that Uh disrupts the the childhood liesel has constructed for herself i forget if it was in part two or part one but i like how max is so self-aware of what he's doing and knows that he's basically putting this huge burden on people but is compelled to do it because he's so desperate for survival that he mm-hmm. never really actually leaves the basement. He doesn't that's like that's what he wants to do. You know, I could imagine it in some movie or a book or what have you where he leaves. You could imagine the note. It in a book, Stephen. I couldn't see. I, I couldn't imagine this being written about. Him. Oh, <laughs> that's <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. That's that's rude. Um, <laughs> I could imagine him like leaving a note and leaving oh, yeah. because he's you know he sees what a problem it is, but. Honestly, I just don't see him ever doing that. I don't think he no. has the the the, the will. The, yeah, That's he does not have the will. That I've really appreciated about this whole story and this cast of characters. We always imagine that in the character, and we're like, "Oh yeah, you know, if I'm writing this, he's gonna be like, oh well, I'm such a burden, so I'm gonna leave and then tough it on my own." If you put that in the terms of real life and you and me, that would not yeah. happen. I no, do think that is, yeah. Even little things in my life, I'm like, I know I'm being a burden on you, but I really need a ride. And so you exactly. take it anyways. It makes you feel like crap, but you still take what other people offer you, even if it's a nuisance yep. to them. And so I really like putting that in this. It just makes everyone seem yep. so real. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I, I know it's a burden, but I'm going to keep making you come to this podcast. Uh, I know it sucks. I hate doing this sorry. every week. And if I was writing a book, I'm not returning your week. sister until, until we're done <laughs> with the season. So. No, that's fine. You can keep her. <laughs> Oh, well, <laughs> wait, oh, she's probably she listening. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> what were you saying, Stephen? Were you saying uh, something well, I was just going to say that um, third person does not uh, recommend uh, kidnapping. Hmm. Well, I do. Or ransom. Am I third person? Because I totally do. <laughs> you're, you're a third or third person. <laughs> oh, shoot. Um, Ooh, funny. Yep. No. Um, all right. So anything else about the relationship between Max and Liesel? Um it's probably my favorite moments. part of the book, other okay. than the death monologue stuff. I did gotcha. not think that was going to happen, but um, it's mm-hmm. hitting this very um, resonant space of um, feeling natural, but also awkward and one of your... surprising. Yeah, I remember one of the first character pairs you wrote in your book a long time ago, and one that still stays with you is that you know 20 something guy who found a young girl and kind of became her surrogate brother Mm -hmm. Uh, it was very similar plot and i think that it just that's been a resonant plot with you and is also kind of an interesting dynamic you don't often get of that um that older brother kind of person who isn't actually related to them coming into the story i think it's a good time to take two people who are completely different stages in their life finding a way to relate anyway you know what that reminds me of uh, it reminds me of The Last of Us. Yeah, that's more of a surrogate father, but it's a similar... But it's these two people, and The Last of Us is a game created by Naughty Dog. They also said the Uncharted series um, for the PS3, and now PS4. Um, it's kind of a post-apocalyptic, a post-apocalyptic world with, with zombies in it, but that's kind of say. selling it short. It's mm-hmm. not about that. It's about these two characters, this, uh, this man who's lost his daughter during the initial apocalypse mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and this girl who was born into the apocalypse and knows nothing else. And they just sort of right. land together and they don't get along. And she's too, like, she's younger than her, his daughter would be. And, you know, he's this grumpy old guy who's kind of mad at the world, but somehow they connect and they keep surviving together. Right. And it's those, those, those quiet moments between them that matter so much. And that's, it's kind mm-hmm. of the same thing in this book, a very different relationship, yeah. but it does remind me of that. So I think you're right. Mm-hmm. There are also some nice touches, Stephen, for this second part, I've been listening to the audiobook, and you've also been listening to the audiobook. 
Um, but there are a lot of cool touches in the original book, uh, especially that uh, book that Max put together for Liesl. They illustrated the whole thing in the book, which I thought was really <gasps> Y'all didn't get that. Oh, that was great. I went back to it and looked it up. That was mm-hmm. And yes, that was a super cool touch. You could even see like fragments of Mein Kampf on mm-hmm. behind it. That was really good. Uh, so That's Abigail, something... Um, that I really yep. liked about the whole mm-hmm. this completely different subject, but that's something I really liked yeah. about the whole thing is uh, the book as a whole. You know, we talked about those little asides from death. I like that they just put in pictures every once in a while, um, right? His and like the and... the seven sided die had some illustrations mm-hmm. during that whole chapter. And yeah, cool. I went back through the book and I'm like, man, they do a lot of cool. How this book is framed in the words is innovative like this book is so good it's telling a familiar story but the storytelling around it is just so out of left field Mm -hmm. yeah that's definitely that's kind of it like it's the story is it's very good but it's nothing special something out of the ordinary Mm -hmm. but it has this this ethereal like deeper larger than life sensation surrounding it just because of who is telling it Mm -hmm. Um, and how the moment you're getting into a comfortable group, he, he sets you aside and says, let's talk about God for a second. And then it's like, <laughs> wait, what is going on? You're spoiling the ending. You're spoiling the beginning. You're like, I, it, yeah. it keeps you on your toes and thinking a little yeah. in, in more dimensions than you would otherwise. Yes, well put. Um, so moving on to my third point here that I wanted to discuss. With discuss, discuss. I'm, I'm drunk now all of a sudden. Uh Rudy's role, <clears throat> Rudy's role and questionable necessity, as in, do we like where Rudy is at this point? Is he need to be there or does he just kind of have to be there? That was kind of our opinion on him at the beginning. He was just kind of a sidekick, um, kind of a comic relief of the book, you might say. Uh, what do you think about Rudy at this point, Stephen? I think Rudy still very much feels like a standard have to be their character. But at yeah. this point in the story, it's more welcome than it was before, for me at least. Mm-hmm. Because before, he was just another element of Liesel's childhood struggles. Um, mm-hmm. But now, he's sort of like the relieving, familiar, comfortable childhood struggles. Uh, while she's having to deal with much more intense things at home. So kind of going back out, outside of the basement and the the whole Jewish Jewish situation, that's hard to say. Um, he's kind of just um, blissfully unaware of everything else that's going on in her life and can just focus on the kid stuff, which is which is kind of nice. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. What do you think, Abigail? I very much liked that he is now, although he still feels very side characterish to me for the most part, I can tell that he's not because he has his own world that he's living in separate from Liesl. Um, and we've been able to see some of that, but basically seeing him get into trouble by himself, seeing him getting, you know, facing his own world of hurt apart from Liesl is showing me, oh, hey, he's still pretty important and he's going to play a role. Um, Mm -hmm. it's interesting seeing his development. He's annoying me a little bit, honestly, because he's a stupid 13 year old boy and 13 year old boys are just annoying (laughs) (laughs) but he's definitely getting his own part and he's also getting a little i like having the threat of rudy finding out about her other life there because while she's hiding Mm -hmm. her jew she's hiding from the nazis she's also hiding from her friends and rudy is whether she would choose to admit it or not is her best friend And Mm -hmm. it's interesting seeing her have to hide that part of her life from him. So um, when it came to the scene where she is trying to get back inside so she can warn her parents that the Nazis are coming, she has to figure out a plausible excuse to get back in or else he's going to ask questions. Later, he comes back over to check on her and she just kind of shoes him away as fast as possible. And it's been it's kind of been an interesting conflict. And I think that that's going to come up a little bit more. Right. Um, I also think he's become a lot more interesting since... um... He, you know, his impending death is around the corner. Because mm-hmm. suddenly everything he does becomes a lot more like, oh, maybe it's the last time he does that or that or that. Mm-hmm. And, you're and kind of thinking, oh, <laughs> as term. he gets into trouble and picks fights, um, I'm just going, no, that's not smart. That's not smart. Just stick your head down. Yeah. Do what you got to do, kid. Pulls out a knife. It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, no so, matter yeah. how deep the trouble is, he's not going to die. Not, not yet. Quite yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. 
Not for two years. Picks a fight with a bomb. That would be bad. <laughs> And that's just not even. That's logical. coming soon because they did also say that the city that they were in gets bombed. That's true. So, and that's, that's true. I think that's one of the things I love about death. <laughs> 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 Out of context quotes on this podcast are fantastic. <clears throat> that's uh, one of the things I love about death is that. Um, what isn't there to love? <laughs> I, I don't know. It's the, my favorite part. Um, anyway, is that. It's sort of this bold... You, I'm pretty sure you can hear all of the fireworks outside. Yeah. I'm sorry, we're recording this on New Year's Eve. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, Gosh darn kids. I thought it was no. a bomb. Oh, geez. oh, right. Houston is being bombed. Damn, By right. Your, your editing is getting creative. I, I like it. Um, anyway, my point. I had a point somewhere. Let me go see if I can find it. Um, sure. It, oh, yes. It was that it's this sort of brave statement... Um, telling you how things are going to end and how characters are going to die and basically exterminating the hooks and excuses you would normally give yourself to continue reading a story and saying you're going to have yeah, – I mean this story is going to be good enough for you to enjoy the pure human emotions and mm -hmm. complications that arise in the moment rather than just saying I have to see how it ends or I have to see how he dies – you know, that's, that's a good point that I was going to bring up when you're halfway through yours and I didn't know where you were going. Yeah, that's where I'm going. Um, and I totally agree with that because typically he even said it himself. Like, you know, the plot twists, the endings, that isn't what interests me about this story. I've seen that a thousand times. It's how it's told and what happens. And it's like, well, that's very analogous to how this book is written. Mm hmm um, where the plot points themselves are interesting. It's all about how they're told and the specifics of what happened and how people deal with it. And kind of just, mm -hmm. not everything feels like it has to be a big plot point. It is kind of just a moment in these people's lives that they may remember or they may not. It's the opposite of, and I don't know why we keep bringing up this TV show, but the opposite of Arrow, where a lot of it's <laughs> oh in the moment character relations and decisions are just kind of boring and dumb and predictable. But at the yeah. very end of the episode, they'll throw like two or three bombshells at you. And you'll be like, right. whoa, I have to see what happens next. And then they ruin them all by the end of the season. Right, and then in the next episode, it's like, okay, that payoff wasn't worth it. But at the end, whoa, who thought that would happen? I have to see what happens next. Yeah. And, it's, yeah. Yeah. and when, you, when you're reading a story like that, it makes you feel less valuable to the storyteller because you're like, they're just dragging me along so that I will give them their money and yes. pay to keep yeah. watching this. But when you get a yeah. really good story that's like, you know what? I'm going to be different. I'm going to tell the story how I want to tell it. And I want you to enjoy it because it's a good story. That makes you feel a little more worthwhile. And it honestly makes me want to finish the book because I want... I felt like it was a challenge when Death said that. He's like, oh, by the way, Rudy dies. Oh, shoot. I spoiled that for you. You know what? It's fine. I'll just spoil it for you. He dies. Two years from now, he dies. And I took that as a challenge to say okay, I'm going to read to the rest of this book and see if it really is as good as it could have been. Because um, uh -oh. most books would hold off. Ideas of how he's gonna die. Or to see mm -hmm. if death is lying, because that's one thing we haven't considered very much, is <laughs> he might be he a is. total liar. Um, that, yeah, but I'm like, still super confused on how seems, much death is making up. He seems like a pretty honest fellow. He does. And he obviously, he doesn't really like, he doesn't like death, which was interesting. Yeah. Um, it's hard for him. Like he says, war is not his best friend. War is the annoying boss over his shoulder. Exactly. So I don't really think he has any reason for us to lie about, or I'm sorry, any reason to lie to us about his job. He might be making some yeah. things up and extrapolating, but I don't think he's going to mm -hmm. outright lie. I feel like he does yeah. kind of like to mess with his audience, though. Yeah. I like sometimes <laughs> say something like, he didn't wake up. For eight days. It's like, oh, well, right. <laughs> thank you for that agenda. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> he, he, he does have his fun with it for sure. I mean, with the name of that chapter that scared yeah. Abigail. Yeah. Yes. He was totally doing Exactly. That. He does like to mess with us. And it's funny. That's something that I've noticed about me as a person. I, I like when people mess with me. I'll get mad at them. Mm. I'll tell them I hate them and I'll hit them or something like that. But I like when people mess with me and mess with my emotions. So when he's doing this to me and he's like, oh, yeah, you know, what to do with a Jewish body? And I just scream because I don't know what to do with a Jewish body. Um, <laughs> it's it's making yeah. me hate the book, but love it because of that. Right. Yeah. And I interestingly, I was pretty sure at that point, even when the 
that line was coming up that Max was not going to die because I feel as long as Rudy's death is impending, mm -hmm. I have the sense of security that no other character is going to die <laughs> until then. And I again, that could wrong. be him playing with you. I, I, I still have a wrong. sneaky suspicion that Hans is going to die. He's told us about Maybe. two times that he's escaped, but it's 2015. We you know that though. he's not alive yeah. now. <laughs> 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 that's a fair point he's so gotta die sometime right sometime. whether it's yeah, the um, or not so that kind of brings me to my next point we've been our transitions here are wonderful which is what is the point of all this and that is do you have a good sense of what the broader plot is going to be or where it's going from this point is it all about hiding a jew when will they win when the war is over i think the more that I read this book, the more that I think the plot is how to live life during World War II. Yeah, I, I kind of do too. I'm not sensing this huge crux coming up. There probably will be some kind of a um, climactic moment, but it's mm -hmm. going to be something like Max's almost death. That was a climactic moment for Act 2. Mm. I don't it's think that there's going to be a Max big plot. dying will be the end. No, I don't think so. It may right. end when the war ends. It may not. Mm -hmm. But Well, we have some clues. We know Rudy's dying. We know that two more times death is going to be near Liesl's. One on, a, I believe, a crashed plane. And a second time with, uh, like, a wreckage of a bombed city. Mm -hmm. uh, so we know those two moments are both happening in Act 3, which is interesting. I was expecting one in each act. Um, but he's saving the second two times he... He meets Lisa are going to be happening in this last third of the book. Mm -hmm. I suppose that um, another way to interpret the story would be the healing of Lisa. Yeah, I was thinking that because too. The, it, you know, it started out death explaining who he was and what the world was, and then Lisa being there completely broken. And throughout these chapters, she has um, kind of. Other people have helped to fix her again, and she's sort of sort she's sorting things out. She's recently seemed to do away with some of the old nightmares, even if it's just replacing the person in them. Um, and maybe, maybe by the end, she will come to some kind of closure or revelation or just contentment. Um, and I don't know if Death has alluded to this or not, but is it possible that the book will end with her dying? Mm. Where he meets the it girl could. one last time, and then that's the end of the story. Maybe that's, that's how he point. knows the whole story. Yeah, maybe she gets bombed. Um, that's interesting. Well, you did mention that the third time that Death sees her is in the wreckage of a bombed city. Uh, we yeah. also know that Rudy's going to die. I highly suspect that those are the same moment. Unless yeah. Rudy's the second death. Because she talked, the... well, he talked, he described his death scene for us already. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm pretty sure that was also amongst wreckage. Well, it depends when yeah. death is relating the story to us. Like he's eventually going to meet her in death. He just has mm -hmm. to. Everyone dies. Yeah. So question that's is, true. how much interaction do they have with death after they die? That's going to be an interesting thing. See if he gets that answered for us. Because he talks about scooping up souls, um, handling some with care and some not. But I'm wondering how conscious those souls are when they get scooped up. I have a feeling he's just the postman, and he has nothing to do with him beyond the, the delivery. At least that's mm -hmm. that's the way I I read it. But he's Hermes. I, essentially, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't I don't know though. That he doesn't really like to get into that stuff. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, are there other forces of life out there hanging around with him? Who knows? <laughs> yeah, that's a. That's an interesting question. And yeah, Death stays really cagey about all of that. He mentions God once or twice. and um, He mentions that he doesn't believe that. in God. Does he mention that? Well, he mentions that he doesn't get answered by God. He doesn't right. outright say that he doesn't believe in him. Um, but he, he interacts with God the way that many humans interact. And in that he's like, well, right. I'll say a prayer, but I don't really hear anything. Yeah, it's just like, I guess my job is appointed and I'll keep doing it. But I... Mm -hmm. I I thought that was a really good moment. It made him very, very human. Because we assume, hey, you're death. You're probably working with the higher beings. But in this case, he's like, well, I'm here. I'm doing what I'm doing, just like you. Uh-huh. Just one step above, and he doesn't know what's above that. It's been interesting. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so we don't know what the point of this book is going to be, but we have some interesting theories. <laughs> it's a weird book. <laughs> so it's to be expected. 
It is a weird book. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to predict. It's kind of quirky. Good. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> so my final point in Ill Settled Security is for me, I've read some other books that take place in World War II. And I know this book isn't necessarily trying to be the darkest book, but I feel like nothing really bad ever happens. And I feel it's an oddly like comfortable and... I'm trying to decide how to put this. I feel safer than I... I feel safer than I think the author, author intends me to feel. Partially because of death's omniscience and partially because of how it's told. And I don't need, like, horrible things to happen all the time, which needs to be the trend with TV shows and books now with Breaking Bad and um, Game of Thrones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I feel like this book almost is pulling its punches more than it intends to and almost feels and maybe it is, more of a YA look at World War II than a real look at World War II. Because I've read some others, and they feel more real than this does. This feels a little bit storytelling. You have what do you to, think? You have to take into account, f- one, not only from whose point of view it's being told, but from what country and at mm-hmm. what point in the war it's being told. That's true. Because right it's now, it's in Germany, which honestly is, for a German citizen, was probably one of the safest places to be, um, besides Switzerland. Um, but it's, it's taking place in Germany. It's not taking place in a super high priority part of Germany. So it's not going to be the first one fired upon. It's taking place in a completely civilian zone. And it is also taking place rather, I don't want to say early in the war because it's, it's not early for the Germans. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, I think it's about 1942 at this point. Yeah. The war got really, really intense towards the last couple of years. Right. It wasn't and, quite as mm-hmm. heart-stoppingly bad. Yeah, and to be fair, it's that. not just the war. It's also, like, all of the characters you feel completely safe with. Exactly. Like, Rosa. And I'm saying this as kind of a criticism. Rosa. Rudy. Uh, what's his name? The Hans. You're just, like, totally trust, golden-hearted... Um, even Max, like you don't ever question if these people are going to betray you. You don't mm-hmm. question if they're going to have real faults. There are some superficial faults to them like Rosa, but in the end, they're all such good people that it's almost there's no tension. You don't wonder, is Rudy going to rat out her secret and tell her and maybe he eventually will. It's kind of like, except for some people who are just like kind of stock mean people, like the leader of the uh, thieving group they meet later on who beats up Ruby, Rudy or the... um or the leader of the Hitler Youth, it feels like everyone involved is just kind of always going to be there for you um, to almost an uninteresting extent. I almost, I don't really see that as a problem given that this Hmm. story so far has focused on telling the story of a girl's life. Um, And that's what's happening. And if I look at my life, the people who surround me constantly, I have no questions as to whether they'll keep a secret. I have no questions as to whether they'll be there for me. Oh, same here. And it's completely safe there's a couple people that i don't Mm -hmm. trust and i don't talk to them and that happens um but if we're looking at it from that point but i mean most stories are more interesting than our lives to be fair but it's true i don't know i mean (laughs) things are making people tense she had a horrible horrible beginning and you know when she first moved in it seemed like rosa was an awful person Mm -hmm. Um, that was really mm -hmm. i'm not saying that rosa was magnificently developed as a character or, or that right. she's particularly nuanced. But I don't personally subscribe to the idea that every story needs points of tension where you can't trust everyone. I agree, but I feel like the story, I get the sense that the story feels it's being a darker story than it is. Mm, I don't think um, so. They, they go, okay. They, I think they, they go kind of out of their, I mean, I wouldn't say the book was out of its way to make you feel comfortable, but mm-hmm. Somehow, Liesl has surrounded herself with people and lives in a house that is difficult to live in and kind of mm-hmm. obnoxious, but safe right. and good. And I, I guess I really well, also she's for me, also really young. Mm-hmm. A, a young kid is not going to understand everything, and they're going to feel relatively comfortable. Yeah, that's true. I guess um, what made me wonder about this is there is a quote on the back of the book from Time that is, Zusak doesn't sugarcoat anything, but makes his ostensibly gloomy subject bearable in the same way Kurt Vonnegut did in Slaughterhouse Five with grim, darkly consoling humor. And like, if that's what he's going for, I don't feel that's a good description of it. And of course, that's what another critic says about it. Mm-hmm. But 
just this idea that I I feel he kind of does sugarcoat a lot of things. What do you think he that, sugarcoats? Um, hmm. I'd have to come up with very specific examples. It was more of a general feel than mm-hmm. if I would go through and find specific events. I mean, it's but, it's oftentimes relaxing to listen to. It is yeah. Uh, Every there's kind of a warmth about it. Nothing mm-hmm. truly bad or perilous or horrible happens on screen. Not since the beginning of the book, but right. it did happen at the beginning of the book. And death has narrated. What was it. the horrible thing that happened at the beginning? Her brother dying. Yeah, that was terrible. Okay. Like that train yeah. ride was just like, like pretty pretty awful. Um, mm-hmm. And. Um, so maybe sugarcoating it isn't the right word, but I also don't really agree with that description. It doesn't set a very accurate tone. Right, and of course that's not the fault of the author. I mean, the, the editor puts a slightly misleading thing on the book. That's fine. But I just get the feeling that it's... And maybe because a lot of the discussion about it has been, you know, how bad Liesl's situation is and that sort of thing. And I don't get the sense that her situation is really all that bad. She's poor, but... As far as they go about the real horrors of poverty or running out of food is Rudy's hungry. Like, it feels like, it feels like I don't really have any sense of danger of her situation except a little bit of the Nazis might find me. And I'm not necessarily saying that's a problem. Sometimes I just feel it contrasts what the situation would actually bring and you never get a sense of real, real danger going on. And not just in the way that the child isn't noticing the danger, but in no one really is. I suppose I can kind of understand that. Um, like Rosa makes a big, gets really upset when they run out of work, but I never really feel the tension that they they won't be able to survive. Yeah, I guess I, so. Here's here's my thinking on that. It's a pretty intangible thing to describe. Yeah. Go ahead. No, well, here's, because I, I know for me personally, um, I am going to relate this back to my own life. Because Mm -hmm. I've been through situations like that. I've been through that long period of time where we're not sure if we're going to have a paycheck to put food on the table. Um, It's happened before. And seeing it through my eyes, not every moment was wrapped up in that, honestly. Oh, yeah. It was an ongoing thought process. It's, okay, you know, how much are we going to have this week? What's going to happen? Are we going to be okay? But honestly, I wasn't concerned with it at all. I was concerned with Mm -hmm. how much school I was getting done. I was getting concerned with what my friends were saying to me and what I was talking about or, you know, doing chores or whatever. And so as I read through Liesl's story, hearing about Rudy's hunger, and honestly, that is kind of getting to me every once in a while. And I'm saying, oh, yeah, that's that really sucks. And they're in a really bad situation. But kids Mm -hmm. are kids, and kids aren't going to focus on that. If they don't have food to eat, they don't have food to eat. They'll get what they can. They'll continue stealing. They'll do whatever they want to do. But that doesn't stop them from riding their bikes. That doesn't stop them from playing soccer because it's not on the forefront of their mind. It's completely out of their control. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's just relating that back to my life, it's completely realistic. I get that it's not quite as exciting, I suppose, but I... I am a very big fan of not making things in books overly exciting. I think that that's a oh, flaw. I agree. So I've very much enjoyed the way that he's doing it. And I am going to flat out say that I completely disagree with you on all of this. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my, uh, that's my, uh, my defense. <laughs> I'm going to wedge in between these two opinions and say that I definitely get what you mean, Brian. And now that I think about it, um, it does seem like there's a certain weight and or consistency yeah. to the trials that may be lacking. But yeah, to be fair, I'm not criticizing it for this. I'm saying I, I don't. Maybe partially it's because death is the narrator, but it's not like I'm saying I want more horrible things to happen. But I feel like the book is tackling incredibly weighty subjects and halfway doing it i and it's i halfway agree with very, you <laughs> yeah, <go ahead. laughs> no i i think i i get what you mean um but then again considering we're so focused on liesel it makes sense that it doesn't all mesh together and that she's yeah. not worried about that and death isn't worried about that he has such a weird high-minded view of things it's it's mm-hmm. going to give you some strange i think it'd be my bigger complaint is that it does feel so normal and death should be making it feel weirder. Other than that, yeah, I don't know if it's a huge issue. Yeah. But. 
Yeah, I guess I just get the sense that it's telling this... Again, I've read other novels that tackle a similar kind of time period and similar things going on. <clears throat> and if I got the sense that this is all because it was from the mindset of a child, that would be one thing. And maybe something that's confusing that is death does not speak like a child. Yeah, Death mm-hmm. speaks with raw honesty. And I'm like, your raw honesty is less honest than people who aren't being raw honest, rawly honest about this sort of stuff, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like, it feels like the book's saying, oh, okay, I'm cutting through this and saying the real truth. And this is still, like, much less than I feel the real truth to be in a lot of ways. Perhaps it's just strange because I can't quite get what death cares about. You know, right. give us all kinds of, like, opinions or thoughts and viewpoints on very human, ordinary, mm-hmm. day-to-day things. But then he'll take a break to, like, tell us the tragedy of the, what the sky looked like and why that was important. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And I think it goes just goes back to I would like more of it to be flavored with death. <laughs> that sounds bad. <laughs> maybe that's what I meant. Like, I may be misattributing the disconnect I feel or, or not explaining it well, but I definitely do feel a lack of weight to the book in one way or another. Yes, not just tension, I agree with but, that. Yeah. It's not an important okay. story. It's yeah, obviously and I don't mind not. that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I've I've read. I know I have at least two other books told by um young girls. Uh, mm-hmm. one would sorry in World War Two. One would be the story of Corey Ten Boom, the hiding place. The other mm-hmm. one is called Number the Stars. Um, right. One. I read that one. Yeah, one's being told. Neither being told from the point of view from of a German. Neither are they being told from the point of view of a Jew. Um, this has been a very different story, though, because it doesn't feel as weighty or as important as the other ones. But I kind of like that. Um, mm-hmm. Every World War II story that I hear is something big, something important. This changed yeah. this, or this happened, or we went to a concentration camp, and that was yeah. huge. Yeah. Um, even in um, the other one that I mentioned, the, the Boy in the Striped Pajamas, that one ended up being really weighty and really important because in the end... He ended up getting in some massive trouble that mm-hmm. affected the rest of his family. His dad was higher up, so it affected him, et cetera, et cetera. I kind of like that this is a small-scale look at, hey, there were actually real people that lived during this time, and there were people that this affected but didn't affect in the way that you thought it yeah. would. I almost feel like it's one of those like life sections in the newspaper just bringing light into mm-hmm. a situation you wouldn't normally look at. Uh, yeah, and I don't know the numbers or statistics, but maybe the other thing that just maybe my bigger problem is that they brought in the Jew. Like mm-hmm. you're hiding a Jew in your basement. Everybody in a World War II story <laughs> hides a Jew at some point, yeah. it seems like. And it's like if you're going to tackle that, maybe it's kind of cool that that can happen without some traumatic event around it. Like surely yeah. there were Jews that just successfully hid. But I guess it was that idea of they just had to bring that plot point in. So you assume it's going to try to be more impactful there and isn't. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not necessarily sure that's a bad thing, but it still does feel kind of unoriginal. And still there's some kind of lack of weight there. So it's a weird To me, this is just that. all residual stuff from our first discussion where we all seem yeah. to have more complaints. And I think those things are just still there. Um, it's just right. a lot of the other elements and story beats and character arcs have been elevated. But still, mm-hmm. there's this kind of... Slightly rudimentary, slightly unfocused, um, bounce along and just kind of tell this typical story that in a way is boring, Mm -hmm. in a way is sincere, and you're right, in a way kind of lacks a certain sharpness of reality, but, um... Right. More death is what we need. And I'm I'm sure I'm just comparing it in my mind to other other World War II stories I've seen and just where it's lacking. And I love that it's just telling a normal person's story, but it seems to be doing in such a self-serious way. Yeah, in also a non-serious way that I'm not sure it all comes together or not. It's kind of like a light-hearted, light-hearted story told in a very serious way, and that juxtaposition is making it confusing. Right, which is the opposite of again that quote, which is like he's not sugarcoating horrible things, and it's like that's kind of the opposite of what he's doing, and that he's making kind of normal things seem darker. It's really weird, <laughs> and I don't know if I like it or not, but I'm interested in it nonetheless. It's definitely it's definitely an interesting read. I yeah. have I've had to throw out all of my prior thoughts on mm-hmm. stories and just been like, okay, I'm just gonna take this for what it is because it's obviously right. nothing that I was expecting. It's been very it's interesting really to have to redefine. 
Exactly. I mean, it's a hard book to discuss, and I think that's what makes it an interesting one to discuss. It's not just like, all right, here are the plot points. Let's discuss if those were good or not. Did they make a fun cast of characters? And was that plot twist predictable? All right, we're done. That was discussing random YA novel number 32. <laughs> um, <laughs> this one brings a lot more to the table um, and thus makes it a, have more uh, yep. nuanced discussions, even if they don't always entirely make sense even to us. I agree with that. <laughs> so do you have any last thoughts on that, Stephen? Um, I, I don't believe so. It, it, was, it was very interesting how our conversations short, sort of evolved into a um, tumultuous... Uh, um, kind of chaos of difficult to describe opinions. Um, kind for, of like the book itself. Kind of like the book itself. That's so consistently thematic. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I, um, I was acting, just trying to be as thematic as I, possible. Kind of to close it out, I think that the book has certainly gotten better as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, the plot between Max and Liesel is far more interesting than all of the Liesel antics we were you know it doesn't feel like yeah, Tom Sawyer that, anymore that's become secondary which is uh, definitely no, a good nothing shift. against Tom Sawyer it's just Tom Sawyer is a better um, Tom mm -hmm. Tom Sawyer yeah Am I no one right? can do Tom Sawyer like Tom there, Sawyer I felt like I was pronouncing that weirdly anyway um, Tom Sawyer my, my favorite Sawyer? Hero. Tom Sawyer Tom Sawyer <laughs> that's what I was looking for um, so yes it's certainly you don't even want to hear me pronounce uh, Huckleberry Finn <laughs> in my unique way <laughs> um and I I I have high hopes that it's going to keep getting better. Um mm -hmm. I just still my old complaint is there. I think it needs to be more consistently through the eyes of death. Um yeah. But we're getting more of that. So that's good. Uh, it went faster this time. It felt like it took so much longer to read that first uh, part of the book than it did to read the second part of the book. Mm -hmm. I don't know mm -hmm. if the, the length... Well, partially because you read ahead. Uh, well, no, not even. Like, I took big oh, okay. breaks during that first one. But this time gotcha. it just... I was much more eager to go back to it. I didn't feel like I was trudging yeah, anymore. Um, which is great. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I've definitely... I'm... Honestly, once we hang up here, I'm going to go and <laughs> start reading the part three. <laughs> it's it's pulled me in by now, and I'm actually invested in people, which it didn't do for the first part. I would not have gone back had it not been for this podcast. Mm -hmm. I probably, not that I didn't want to, I just would have forgotten about it. It was low priority, yeah. but I really want to see the end now. Not because I want to yeah. find out what happens, <laughs> because I think that anything big happens, but just because I want to see the wrap up. That's what yeah, I, I feel with books especially, so many of our points of confusion or our criticisms, you can't solidify until you see how he wraps it mm -hmm. up, because maybe all of this makes sense. Like, think of trying to criticize Fight Club if you only saw the first half of it. <laughs> like, you yeah. can't. Um, there's just, and maybe it ties together in a way I'm not seeing currently, or maybe they make a twist on the whole hiding a Jew concept and, and bring it to new life or something like that. So I'm also really curious just to see how thematically they wrap it up and where he's intending to go with all of this, yeah. um, since it's really not clear to me at this point. Um, so yeah, uh, my, my advice for you, Abigail, is save at least like a chapter or two to read the, before we record so you don't just like finish it and then lose interest in the two weeks say, oh, right, I have to talk about the book, don't I? I'll take lots of notes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I just I have found it very interesting to talk about something directly after reading it for the first oh, time. Oh yeah, that's absolutely. Kind of one of my thoughts. Yeah, like precious. Abigail was mentioning story of beats that I read today, so it's very fresh. Right. In my mind. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, all right. Any last thoughts before we close out here? Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you too, and I cannot wait until next week where we, uh, well, I guess the week after next week, <laughs> yeah. where we uh, right. talk about the third part of uh, this great book. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. <laughs> this, that is a great book. <laughs> okay. Nice. <laughs> I guess I'll jump into outro stuff here. <laughs> on that wonderful note. On that hilarious note. All right. So as Stephen alluded to, uh, next week we're going to have a bookmark episode. We don't know what yet. But the week after that, we're going to be discussing Act 3 of The Book Thief, which is going to be uh, Part 7 through the epilogue. So just read the rest of it. See what you think. Man, that's exciting. Yeah, we're actually going to finish and a book. Uh, Stephen, do I, do I get we're to going choose on to yours next, so choose okay. a book. Okay. Please don't make it that World War II novel. You I would like to choose <laughs> the first book I see on my bookshelf, which is okay. the history of Sonic the Hedgehog. So guys, what? Yay, get I've ready for a wild for ride. So long. Homework assignment. You all have to write a piece of Sonic the Hedgehog fan fiction. <gasps>
After, after <laughs> mine is going to be about <laughs> Emerald, the robot who was created in Sonic Battle for the Game Boy Advance. I remember him. Yeah. Good luck. Okay. All right. Uh, if you want to find us on Twitter, after all that, uh, go to Third Person. Pretty simple. Just at Third Person. Wait, aren't Email we third show? Third Person Show? Then why are my notes incorrect? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you wrote the notes. Did you hot sabotage my notes, Stephen? Man, I might have subconsciously. I'm sorry. All right. Well. We have your subconscious to thank for completely interrupting my flow, don't we? It, wait, am I your subconscious? Is that what that happened? Would that, would that would explain. That would explain much. A lot. <laughs> so look for us at Third Person Show on Twitter. The email is thirdpersonshow at gmail dot com. Uh, we're also on Facebook. You guessed it. We're third person storytelling podcast. Or are we third person show? I think it's we're just, just third person. person. A I just podcast. like the Facebook page today. Wow. So yeah, y'all should do it too. A little slow on that. <laughs> <laughs> I made it. I um, forgot that we had one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, we are a product of the Whales Are Whales Network. Go to whalesarewhales.com for more awesome shows like this with awesome people like us. I am on Twitter at Lord Meldor. Stephen is on Twitter at Stephen Kelly 180. And Abigail is on Twitter. Let's see if I can remember this. Is it still Aimless Hyperbole? No! Is it Thinky Read? It's the Thinky Reader. That's so weird. It's the thinky reader. Yeah, you confuse me on social media. wouldn't fit. Oh, I know the pain. Yeah. I know the pain with many show names. All right, so it's the the thinky reader? Yeah. All right, and she's on Twitter there tweeting about... I, I don't know. What do you tweet about? I don't know, but obviously <laughs> it's interesting because every time I tweet, I get a follower, so look me up. Every time. Every time I get at least one follower, so... Every time a bell rings, Abigail gets a Twitter follower. Yeah. Um, so. I kind there of just are. tweet funny stuff, so I'm worth following. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And that'll do it. Uh, thank you, Stephen. You're welcome. Thank you, Abigail. You are welcome. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Have a great week. And, oh, shoot, I need a new outro, don't you I? You just say Happy New Year. Oh, wow, that's so normal and great. <clears throat> Have a great next 365 days, everybody. That was so great and normal. <laughs> And graceful. So normal. Slick. <laughs> uh, you can make it on the right. streets. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>